Many Americans feel that their country is extraordinary because their constitution is extraordinary. Any constitution would seem extraordinary to you if you have only read the one. I mean, really, people like to disrespect my crew, but the fact is that you know my name and I don't know you. And Americans are indeed encouraged from their early childhood to read the constitution in a kind of poetic isolation where each verse of this strange poem is open to a very modern, very abstract interpretation where it has been abstracted from the particular historical circumstances of its writing, the intellectual background that provided the authors with what they saw as their available options in putting together a constitution from various precedents and influences. Um, the American constitution is not presented as being closely comparable to other cross currents that were then ongoing in European civilization and culture. It's not presented as something very similar to and intellectually derivative of the work of the Baron de Montesquieu. It's not presented as something closely comparable to and derivative of the work of Cesare Beccaria, author I'd like to talk about most of all in this video. And of course, the sense of American uniqueness would start to diminish, not only if you saw the Constitution in that context, but if you started engaging in the comparative study of constitutions in the plural, putting the United States Constitution next to the experiments that went on in other countries around the world in the century that followed after, or other constitutions around the world as they exist today in the 21st century. America would seem slightly less special by degrees. It's also true that all of us live with a sort of denial about the huge cultural gap that differentiates us in our assumptions from the authors of that constitution. I think most Americans do grow up with a few anecdotes about their founding fathers shooting each other in duels. Melissa, did you, did you learn about that in school? Did you ever get a funny anecdote about this or that president of the United States or members of Congress and the Senate in those days fighting each other in duels? Was that part of the... I guess so. Yeah, part of the spice of life growing up in America. Not very much. Well, it's it's a pretty fundamental assumption that it was your civic right as a gentleman. And the word gentleman has a lot of untranslatable significance in the English language that it was your right as a gentleman to settle your disputes through a duel by fighting to the death. And uh, this is something I've read discussed in many sources, some formal and informal. Um, I remember one book that was a formal study of the history of dueling, and that book's thesis was that the United States was a little bit old-fashioned at the time of the writing of the Constitution. It was maybe 50 years behind uh, the trend in countries like England and France, but all the major European countries, England, France, Italy, Russia, they all emerged from a medieval culture of dueling at their own pace, whether slowly or quickly, they came into this more modern sense that if you murdered someone, it was a crime, whether or not that person consented to have a fight to death with you. But at the time of the writing of the Constitution, perhaps much more alien than the assumptions that surrounded slavery, much more alien than the uh, assumptions that surrounded genocide of indigenous people, war, conquest, and enslavement of indigenous people, perhaps most alien of all was this assumption that I think all of the Right, the authors of the Constitution participated in this assumption. I think a hundred percent of them shared. Prove me wrong if you guys know. Someone might email me, email me in an exception to the rule. It's possible. I think a hundred percent of them shared in the culture of the duel. So I'm opening this video by suggesting to you that Americans today, in 2019, the American public is not merely passively ignorant of the intellectual legacy of the Baron de Montesquieu and uh, Cesare Beccaria. They're actively ignorant of this. It's a self-selected intentional blindness because they prefer to see their own constitution as a kind of perfect abstract poem, which it is not. It is instead the deeply flawed product of very peculiar cultural circumstances. And those circumstances are so peculiar that they include the outrageous assumption that men ought to be able to murder one another in a duel, 
that parents ought to be able to circumcise their own children, cutting off part of their penis, that human beings ought to be able to enslave other human beings to hunt and capture indigenous people there within the United States of America and put them into slavery. Um, many other forms of slavery besides uh, just the importation of people of African ancestry as slaves. And indeed, this brings me back to what inspired this video. The intellectual legacy of Cesare Beccaria is all over the American Constitution. Uh, again, you can send me an email if you can name a single author of the Constitution who ever disclaimed that they were not influenced by Cesare Beccaria or who said that they were opposed to his legal philosophy. This was an unbelievably influential source for about 150 years after its publication. And one of the reasons why it was so influential, in contrast to books today, is that it's sort of written in brief expostulations that invite further debate. Um, it's the sort of text that people would sit and read aloud in short passages in a drawing room or a salon. And remember, it's not just that people were illiterate in the past. Glasses were very expensive uh, to, to read through lenses. And the majority of people on Earth, I think still today, a very large percentage of people can't really read or can't read well without wearing glasses. So one person would read aloud and other people would sit around and comment and discuss. It's much forgotten today in the same way that people used to play music together with instruments because they didn't have other forms of entertainment. People used to read together and comment on and discuss what they were reading. And this resulted in different styles of book becoming popular. Uh, even at the dawn of the newspaper, that was one of the most commonly seen sites where people reading out the short stories from the newspaper, reading them aloud to gathered people in a tea house, in a coffee house, in a bar, or what have you. Um, the social element of reading aloud has largely disappeared from reading, and likewise, the social element of playing music has largely disappeared from music, as digital forms of music have become cheap and ubiquitous, and other forms of entertainment now exist to, uh, to distract us. Now, there was a controversy. There was a controversy caused by Kanye West questioning why, in the American Constitution, slavery is protected for people committed to prison. Now, why indeed? Uh, I can also ask, why do Americans engage in these debates? Why do they ask these questions without ever pressing forward for answers? There is an answer. There's an incredibly obvious answer. And the answer is Cesare Beccaria. The answer is, all of these guys read the philosophy of law set down by Cesare Beccaria. Beccaria wasn't a legislator proposing particular laws. As I say, his style of writing is more expository and inviting debate, but he really set out a sort of meta-law, a sort of meta-legislation, within which the, the authors of the Constitution filled in the details. Now, the Baron de Montesquieu, another incredibly important influence, a topic for another video. And Cesare Beccaria he actually argued against torture and he also argued against the death penalty and this made him seem incredibly enlightened incredibly progressive incredibly positive for his era and of course this is misleading ultimately we have a sort of radical incommensurability between our expectations and interests today in the 21st century and the assumptions that are written into the american constitution and this is precisely why americans don't really want to know what's in their constitution. In the same sense that meat eaters want to buy hot dogs and live in a kind of ignorance about what's really in the hot dog. They don't want to see what happens in the factory. They don't want to see what's in the slaughterhouse. There's a pleasing allusion to the wholeness of the hot dog as one finished unit. Americans don't really want to see where their constitution came from either. Perhaps because if they did know those things, it would force them to question and ultimately reject the authority of the authors of their constitution as people who were in some ways just wrong um, and in other ways frankly evil. So Cesare Beccaria in this context set down as a very positive thing from his perspective the idea of slavery as a punishment rather than torture rather than execution. 
he really thought it was a very good thing to have slaves as punishments for serious crimes. And it is not written into the Constitution accidentally or due to vague wording. Those men who wrote the Constitution, some of them positively believed in, in the enslavement of Africans, but they absolutely believed in, uh, what do you ever say, carceral slavery or slavery as a form of incarceration. I, I don't know how, how better to put it. Penal slavery, that's the term I'm looking for. Okay. Now, likewise, if we were to ask the question today, as almost every day of the year, there are questions circulating about why the ownership of guns is protected in the United States Constitution in the peculiar way that it is. And today, the whole left wing will jump up and say, ah, technically, the Constitution doesn't quite say that. Technically, it's a little bit vague or unclear to what extent that passage of the Constitution is talking about the rights of individual people to own guns, and to what extent it's talking about the rights of the states, of local governments, don't, or even the, say, the local city authorities. Don't, to what extent is it saying one or the other? Well, if you wanted to know the answer, just like getting to the bottom of these other issues, what, what would you look into? You'd look into the writing of Cesare Picaria. It's the depressing truth. And guess what? Just as all these men who participated in writing the Constitution participated in duels, participated in dueling, they believed in the barbaric, laughable cultural practice of men killing each other over a point of honor. So too, by the way, did supposedly enlightened thinkers like um, Tolstoy and Turgenev in Russia. Each of these countries in Europe, Russia, Italy, France, uh, they emerged from the culture of the duel at a different rate. But Tolstoy and Turgenev, um, over nothing, uh, they were going to duel to the death uh, while well, they were riding a train together. And um, they had to wait for the train to come to a station where it would stop long enough for them to get out of the train and shoot each other, then get back on the train. And by the time the train got to that station, they'd both calm down and they decided to cancel the duel. Well, if they'd shot each other, I guess the history of Russian literature would have either been missing out on Tolstoy or Turgenev. One or the other of them would have gotten shot. Possibly both. Sometimes both men would, would die in a duel, whether they were fought with, uh, with swords, knives, or, uh, or with guns. So y you want to tell me that the authors of the Constitution participating in this gruesome, awful culture of honor killings, there's a loaded term, of uh, duels to the death, you want to tell me they didn't believe in private, personal gun ownership. Well, what does what does Cesare Beccaria, their source book, their philosophy of meta-legislation, what does, what does it say? Well, he opens his passage saying that um, there are all these absurd laws that people propose in the time that we live. People propose laws that are just as absurd as trying to make fire illegal because people are afraid of being burnt people who want to make water illegal because of the fear of drowning. Along with absurd laws of this kind, he includes in the same category the concept of a law to forbid people from wearing arms. Wearing arms here means carrying a gun, possibly carrying a sword, because these laws would disarm only those who are not disposed to commit the crime which the laws mean to prevent. Can it be supposed that those who have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity and the most important of the code will respect the less considerable and arbitrary injunctions, the violation of which is so easy and of so little comparative importance, he asks. Again, the style of this, you can see, he's not really presenting facts or evidence. He's raising these questions, and then the readers at this time, quite possibly reading this aloud, would engage in discussion. Does not the execution of this law deprive the subject of that personal liberty so dear to mankind and to the wise legislator? Question mark. God. Yeah, you, you really see why this style of writing had to die with the 18th century. It just, just didn't make it into the 19th century, let alone the 20th. And does it not subject the innocent to all the disagreeable circumstances that should only fall on the guilty? It certainly makes the situation of the assaulted worse and of the assailants better, and rather encourages than prevents murder, as it requires less courage to attack unarmed than armed persons. So to be clear, at the end there, what he's suggesting is that if you deprive people of their right to carry guns, 
or to carry arms, um, then it's only going to cause more murder because, you know, the victims of murder or theft or robbery will be disarmed, whereas the criminals will not be. So this excuse, in less florid language, is still with us to this day in the USA. <laughs> this debate never ended in 2019. And this really was the guiding philosophy behind the United States of America in its bizarre social experiment of setting up a quote-unquote constitutional republic, not a democracy, a constitutional republic of gun-carrying slave owners who would fight each other to the death over a point of honor and who participated in a fundamentally aristocratic set of values, philosophy of state and government, that is completely repugnant to us to this day. I think if we go back now and study the Baron de Montesquieu and uh, Cesare Picaria, the whole legal philosophy of that era, and we read the American Constitution in that context, and if we even just compare it to other constitutions at the time, let alone constitutions of modern European states like Portugal and Germany that you know wrote new constitutions in the 20th century, I don't think anyone could come to the conclusion that the American Constitution is some kind of unimpeachable masterpiece. On the contrary, it was an experiment. And by definition, an experiment is something you undertake with the outcomes being unknown and unknowable. And in many obvious ways, that experiment has now failed. And the American people want to ignore the first principles that lurk beneath the particular wording of their constitution, precisely because they're terrified to discover that those first principles may be bad and repugnant and wrong. Laws, ultimately, are just words written on pieces of paper by fallible men and women. And this whole tradition began with Solon in Athens. And Solon made the fateful mistake of writing laws in poetry that was inspirational and vague to hear, but that was open to interpretation and reinterpretation. And that is why all of the authors of the time, including even Aristotle, say that Solon's constitution, that his intellectual legacy, did not work. In some ways, I feel like the Western world, burdened with this notion of a poetic and vague and inspiring constitution from Solon and ancient Athens, we're still catching up with where China was 2,300 years ago with the Han Feitze. We're still catching up with examining the most fundamental principles. What it is to have rule of law what is the role of the public? What is the role of the elites that control so much in our society? I think those are questions we've been sleepwalking alongside. They're questions we just haven't wanted to ask. Because frankly, if we ask them, it would lead us to all kinds of uncomfortable answers. Like, how is it we came up with these excuses for separation of church and state that ensure that religious families are going to cut off parts of the penises of their male children forever and ever and ever, that circumcision never gets challenged, that religious authority is in fact protected and propounded and perpetuated for how many centuries? Forever. Why does the Constitution have this stuff about the progress of science? What is the meaning of democracy? The meaning of democracy cannot be living your life in a perpetual state of intellectual indebtedness to a class of slave-owning, gun-toting, dual-fighting, aristocratic bigots from centuries ago, men whom today you would not agree with on any issue whatsoever, not even the meaning of something as simple as the separation of church and state. I mean, really, people like to disrespect my crew, but the fact is that you know my name and I don't know you.